2013 regular meeting of the Troy Planning Commission. Copies of the agenda for tonight's meeting are available at the entrance to the room. Additionally, the agendas and minutes of prior meetings are available on the city's website. The meeting will be conducted in accordance with the agenda as presented or amended by the Planning Commission. The roles and responsibilities of the Planning Commission are outlined on the reverse side of tonight's agenda. State law establishes planning commissions. The commission is comprised of nine members, all of whom have volunteered to serve. Members are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by city council. The other individuals seated at the dais this evening are representatives of the city's planning department, city's uh, attorney's office, and the city's planning consult consultant, Carlisle Workman Associates. If you wish to address the planning commission, please come forward when recognized and provide your name and address on the sign-in sheet. Please begin your remarks by stating your name for the benefit of the commissioners. All remarks are to be addressed to the planning commission, not to anyone else in the room. At this time, I ask that all cell phones, Blackberries, PDAs, or any other devices that might disrupt this meeting please either be placed in silent mode or turned off. Now, there are several items on tonight's agenda where we have closed the public hearing, but we will allow people to come and speak to those items. Um, who's going to do the roll call? I'll do, I'll do the roll call. <clears throat> Mr. Edmonds. Here. Mr. Hudson. Mr. Kempen. Here. Mr. Krent. Here. Mr. Sanzika. Here. Mr. Shepke. Here. Mr. Schultz. Here. Mr. Stratt. Here. Mr. Tagle. Here. All right, second item is the approval of the agenda. Uh, we have a motion. Move the agenda as prepared. Second by Mr. Stratt. Mr. Kempen. Yes. Mr. Krent. Yes. Mr. Sanzika. Yes. Mr. Shepke. Yes. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Mr. Stratt. Yes. Mr. Tagle. Yes. Mr. Edmonds. Yes. Item number three, the approval of the minutes from the May 28, 2013 special study meeting. Has everyone had a chance to review them? Any questions, comments, or entertain a motion? Mr. Edmonds. I would move to approve as published. I'll second. Mr. Krent. <clears throat> Mr. Kempen. Yes. Mr. Krent. Yes. Mr. Sanzika. Yes. Mr. Shepke. Yes. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Mr. Stratt? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. <clears throat> Item number four, public comments for items that are not on the current agenda. If there's anyone that would like to speak to any item not on the agenda, now is the time. Seeing no one, we'll move to item number five, which is the first postponed item. This is a special use and preliminary site plan review, file number SU-401, proposed Midwest Industrial Metals, Inc., 2222 Stevenson Highway, Section 26, currently zoned IB, Integrated Industrial and Business District. And Mr. Carlisle, are you? Yes. Good evening. Um, the first item tonight before you is um, the applicant is proposing a uh, materials, indoor materials recovery facility located at 222 Stevenson. Material recovery facilities are a special use in the IB District. Um, this application was last reviewed by the Planning Commission at their March 12th meeting. And at that meeting, the Planning Commission heard testimony from adjacent neighbors regarding three issues for consideration. The first was excessive noise, especially during the summer months when the doors are open. The second is in regard to site upkeep and general tidiness of the site. And the third is a lack of site screening for adjacent properties. Um, in response, the applicant has resubmitted a site plan um, that have addressed a number of the issues. The first um, issue addressed by the applicant is they are proposing um, to install or um, there is an existing six foot high fence along the north and south property line. They're proposing to um, use a uh, plastic vinyl screening on that uh, to ensure um, site screening to the adjacent north and south property. They're also going to maintain the existing nine foot high fence to the or, uh, concrete masonry wall to the east, uh, which is adjacent to the single family pr uh, residential <laughs> properties. Um, I do want to note that because this is a special use, the Planning Commission uh, may require additional screening they may require a masonry wall on the north and south property line. Um, in, however, in order to do that, they have to determine that there's a protection of public safety, health, and welfare um, that's justified for the additional screening requirements. Um, if not, the six-foot high fence with the proposed vinyl screening should be sufficient for screening to the north and the south. Um, in regards to noise, uh, we do note that they are taking a lot of their existing um, activities on the site and moving it all in, indoors. Um, however, uh, they do open, apparently they do open some of the overhead uh, doors for access. They do open those during the summer months. Uh, so that, that obviously is a noise concern to the adjacent neighbors. 
as a condition of approval, if the Planning Commission does approve this special use, we do note that those doors should remain closed at all times unless being open for access purposes only. Um, and that should be a condition of the resolution that, that moves forward. Um, lastly, the issue of code enforcement came up and we did follow up with any zoning violations. Um, your packet does include a memo or an email from Gary Bowers of the Code Enforcement Division, which he outlines his latest um, review of the property. He did note that since August 24th of 2012, the site has been cleaned up and as of June 3rd of this year, there have been no violations. Um, so it is safe to say that while there were issues with the site prior to August of last year, the site has been cleaned up and is, is, comes into compliance and is a much tidier and upkept site than what uh, was there previously um, by, the, by the same user. Uh, we do find that the use meets all uh, material cover use standards set forth in section 6.17, as well as do, uh, does meet the special use standards located in section 6.02. So in summary, do recommend approval, provided that the Planning Commission finds that the proposed screening is sufficient on the north and south property lines, as well as the east elevation doors remain closed during all hours, um, except for access purposes. Thank you, Mr. Carlisle. Any mm -hmm. questions for our consultant? Is the petitioner here? Good evening. Uh, Robert Stefani appearing on behalf of the uh, petitioner. I have uh, Mark Hewins, uh, the president of the petitioner, with me. Would you like to add anything? Uh, we uh, we believe Carlos? we've, as, as the, the report indicates and the photos demonstrate, we've taken great effort to, to uh, come in with in compliance of, with the property uh, requirements. Um, I'll note that the, the you know the back lot which we've agreed that we're going to pave and I, I, I sent some uh, we, we started to do that the paving contract we used uh, went silent on us and we've had to get uh, new proposals out for that and we've, we've done that and we expect to have the paving done in the rear lot uh, within the next seven uh, or excuse me 21 to 30 days so that still is going to be taken care of it's been graded and cleaned up and and such. Um, I think the pictures speak for themselves in terms of uh, the, the way the operation is happening, uh, going on there now from when, when we started this process last August. And um, I, that, that, that should pretty much sum up what, where we are with this. Um, the, uh, we are going to uh, put the opaque screening up to, to clarify with the neighbors in terms of making the site uh, tidy looking. Okay. Um, although there's nothing going on outside any more longer. So. All right. Just to clarify, uh, your email was distributed to the Planning Commission, the email that explained the situation right. with the paving company and the bids, that, 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 was, that was forwarded okay. as requested. Okay, yeah, th that had the quotes in there that we've had to go out and rebid the re it and we're going to enter into a contract here that we may have Probably. done that uh, sh this week. Okay. So All right. we, are, we are still going to take care of that, that issue. So. All right, thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? I've got a quick one. Yes, Mr. Cran. I just want to understand what 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 time of evening would your business be closing down no there's no more trucks no more noise 5 p.m. is the we close to the public usually by 5 30 we're locked up and out of there thank other you. than a few office staff very nice thank you anything else all right if you'd have a seat just for a moment like I had said earlier the public hearing has been closed but if there is anyone in the audience who would like to speak to this item please step forward <coughs> My name's Marv Reinhardt. I do live in that trailer park. Luckily, further enough away from that place, so it really doesn't bother me. But I do hear high lows. I don't know who it is. Doesn't matter. Just beeping. But the excuse I've heard about this place is that we knew that there was a industrial park next to where we moved to. Well, I moved there in the year 2000. That place wasn't there. And so far is asked for special treatment special treatment upon special treatment to get inside the city of Troy. And it's already been violating, they don't keep up the place. I would recommend somehow like they do in Birmingham, because you can't take care of the place, the city would do it and just charge them. So that way you can see all the junk they stick out in the, in, in the road by accident, they didn't do it, it's the type of vehicles that the people use to use this place, drop stuff off, and I have, you know, my tires cost 350 bucks a piece, and because of the fine whatever they have, it destroys the tire. Even though it's not supposed to go flat, it eats into the tire. So I get that, that type of flat. You know, my indicator says it's a flat, but nobody can find the flat type of deal. 
okay? And, uh, and two, when you guys took out that sign that stopped people from turning, people now back up all the way to that area. They can't get through the light like they used to. It used to be they would stop at, you know, three o'clock and every car could get through the light. Now it backs up almost to the trailer park, which is in front of the only reason I'm saying that is some of that mess might not be there. All I'm saying is, two, there should be some type of air quality monitoring of that area because they're putting stuff into the air. It's never been in that area. And sometimes there are whiffs of chemical. It might not be them. It might be somebody else. But because of that, we don't need to wake up and have 50 people dead at the trailer park because of some whatever, bad press for the amount it would take to monitor if there's any stuff coming out. And that's all I got to say. I'm not anti them. I'm just saying, you know, there used to be a stamping plant next to me. Thank God that's gone, you know. But I'm just saying, you got to look further out than in, you know, because there are different gases, you know, because of the metals. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak on this item? Mike Damon, uh, Damon LC. We own the property to the north, and uh, the property uh, 1180 East Big Beaver is our address. Is there a sheet right over here? Uh, but at any rate, um, they've cleaned it up uh, tremendously since uh, over the last two years. It was really a, a disaster. But I would just ask that the uh, approval be subject to this asphalt being installed and inspected, and then that the fence be fixed as well as the opacity being applied because it's been damaged that's oh, it okay thank you yeah. anyone else all right we get back to the commission any discussion i have a question yes mr schultz uh ben you said something about requiring masonry walls has some guideline can you go over that again? Yes. Yeah, so if the Planning Commission finds that the six-foot high fence and the proposed screening, um, because it is vinyl, it, it, there is a tendency for it to be in disrepair, um, not last as long as the masonry wall. If the Planning Commission finds that there's a need for additional screening because it's a special use, the Planning Commission can require uh, either an eight-foot high fence with screening, a six-foot high masonry wall, or an eight-foot high masonry wall. That has to be, um, but that has to, there has to be a finding of the Planning Commission that, that this needed to protect uh, adjacent properties for health, health safety and welfare purposes. So there has to be a, a, a demonstrated need for that, for that additional screening. Um, we find that we think the six-foot high fence with the screening is sufficient. But if the Planning Commission does find there's additional need, since it's special use, additional screening could be required by the Planning Commission. Okay, I'm, if I may. Yes, continue. Um, if, if we look at Mr. Bauer's third picture, I believe, taken on June 4th in our package, which I believe is looking to the southeast corner of the property. I can see right through that six-foot fence and see one of the homes in that mobile home park. And I think there would be sufficient public safety and welfare to have that, at least some portion of that south wall replaced with a masonry wall so that um, when the vinyl blows out, and somebody forgets to replace it, these people don't have to look at whatever the condition is in that yard. I don't know if it's 50 feet or 30 feet or what would be required to screen those homes that can see through that chain link fence or see that chain link fence, I guess. Bob, what, how would you feel if that wall came to the, to the back of the building in that photograph? I think that would be I think that would be a perfect solution. Okay. Any other discussion? Mr. Savarin. Yeah, just a clarification. Mr. Damon indicated that he wanted the, to uh, make sure that the, the back of the lot was asphalted. I just wanted to clarify that the site plan does show the back part, portion of the property being asphalted. So they're going to have to comply, which they obviously indicate they intend to do. So, But it, we look at the site plan as a contract, right. and they are, they are proposing to asphalt the back of the property. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I question the requirement to screen the south fence. I mean, especially a brick screening wall. It, that's very expensive. 
uh, this opaque fabric, fabric, I think, would still do the uh, job as uh, as required to uh, to uh, hide the um, the facility. I don't think the facility has any uh, issues in the back where it is uh, unsightly, and uh, I think he's doing a great job now. And and I think uh, you know he's learned his lesson. I think we've come a long way, and I I hate to uh, uh, you know uh, harm the man by having him spend all that money for a brick wall that really isn't necessary. We haven't had any complaints from the property owners to the south. So I, I really couldn't support a motion. That includes the, uh, the brick wall to the south. Mr. Edmonds. Uh, I would disagree. I, I agree with Mr. Schultz that it definitely should be. I think the south wall is the area where the scale is at. And practically every customer has to go across that scale. So if somebody has stuff sticking out of uh, their load, they could easily damage that, uh, that opaque. Am I wrong? No, no, I'm sorry. I was just pointing that we don't have any side monitors tonight. Sorry. <laughs> yes, Mr. Krent. I've got a comment for staff. Um, who monitors the condition of that vinyl screening on that fence? In other words, let's say in five or 10 years, that vinyl gets a bit shredded. Um, how do we know at what point in time, um, I mean, is it obviously if the applicant didn't maintain that, he's in violation of this uh, special use, but, you know, how does that work? Basically, um, again, the site plan is treated like a contract, and if they're approved in one of the conditions, either, either in the resolution or on the site plan, was that there be some type of opacity there. Um, and it was constructed, but then eventually it, it failed. There was gaps in the fence or the, the, the fence, the panel came down or whatever. Um, they would be required to fix it. And um, we're not, uh, the city's not going to visit the site every week and ensure that, that it's happening, but through the neighbors complaining, uh, because really we, we don't want to trespass and, you know, be kind of heavy handed like that. But, um, you know, the, the neighbors who would be looking out their back, at their back windows and seeing that the, a portion of the fence would come down would contact us. And then we would eventually take, inform the uh, the property owner of the need to bring it up to compliance. And and what if they didn't? What what happens? Would they be um, they'd be in violation of the of special use approval, and uh, be served with a be essentially a ticket, and we would take enforcement action on them. Okay, thank you. Well, okay. Mr. Kerr. In that case, if this if that visual screening is going to be maintained, I don't see a necessity. To put up a masonry wall, well, the masonry wall would be desired. Would be nice, um, and if the applicant would l like to do that at some point, it would be welcome. But uh, at this point, I would say if that screening is adequately maintained, uh, I don't see a reason why we should ask for a masonry wall. Thank you. Any other discussion? Are we ready for a motion? I'll make a motion. <clears throat> Can I glass this on for a sec? Resolve that special use approval and preliminary site plan, plan approval for the proposed Midwest Industrial Metals, Inc. 2222 to Stevenson Highway, Section 26, currently zoned IB, Integrated, Bus uh, Integrated Industrial and Business District, be granted subject to the following. The East elevation doors to remain closed except for access purposes. Second. Second by Mr. Stratt. Roll call. Mr. Krent. Yes. Mr. Sanzika. Yes. Mr. Shepke. Yes. Mr. Schultz. No. Mr. Stratt. Yes. Mr. Tegel. Yes. Mr. Edmonds. No. Mr. Kempen. Yes. Six yeses. Motion passes. Motion, motion passes. Congratulations. All right, next item. Number six, special use and preliminary site plan review, file number SU-404, proposed United Ventures 2, LLC, 
West of John R., North of Maple, 1861 Birchwood, Section 26, currently zoned IB Integrated Industrial and Business District. Mr. Carlisle? Yes, thank you. Um, the second item tonight um, is actually the third time the Planning Commission has considered this request on behalf of the applicant. The applicant is seeking a special use approval to use <coughs> their site at 1861 Birchwood um, as a contractor's yard. Um, the applicant has submitted uh, two prior site plans. The first, um, the latest site plan reviewed by the Planning Commission included 11 vehicles and 17 employee parking spaces. Um, at that time, the application was reviewed by the City's Traffic Engineering Consulting, Mr. Deering of OHM Consulting. Um, he found that in total, uh, the number of vehicles and the number of uh, employee parking spaces um, led the site to, to be too, uh, too much activity for the limited and narrowness of the site and the site area. Um, his concern was that site operations would extend onto Birchwood, Birchwood Drive, which already has sufficient um, circulation and parking issues already, um, already um, affecting the street. Um, so the applicant was sent back and um, asked to revise their site plan application to reduce the number of vehicles that would potentially impact operations on the site and hence Birchwood Drive. The applicant has come back with a revised site plan that's reduced the number, total number of landscape trucks to eight, as well as employee parking to 16 spaces. Uh, the revised uh, plans were reviewed by Mr. Deering. Um, his comments um, stand from what he initially said. He did feel that even with eight landscape trucks and 16 employee sp uh, parking spaces, the site was compromised in terms of circulation. Um, I think Mr. Deering's issues and concerns weren't in the total number of vehicles once they were all on site in the employee parking. It was the maneuverability of the vehicles and the employee parking and how those kind of stage and work in, in cooperation. Um, he felt that eight landscape vehicles and 16 um, employee parking uh, spot spaces were too much for the site and the narrowness of the site moving forward. Um, I do want to note that the plan that Mr. Deering reviewed included 18 employees parking spaces. The applicant has reduced that to 16, which is, which is what is required by code. I did inform Mr. Deering that the applicant was able to lose two parking spaces to a total of 16 employee spaces, and his comments still stand that he felt that it was too much uh, on, the, on the site. Um, so based on the recommendation of the, the city's traffic engineering consultant, uh, we're asking the applicant to revise their site plan to reduce the number of vehicles so that um, the impact <coughs> on the is negated and all activities can take place on the site. Again, I don't know the number of what that, num what that is. I think it's going to be have some cooperation with the, the city's traffic engineering consultant to determine what that number is, um, but we're asking the applicant to revise their site plan. Um, all that being said, the applicant has submitted a maneuvering plan in the packet. They are here tonight to discuss that, and so I'll take field questions, but the applicant is here to explain their revised maneuvering plan uh, for the Planning Commission's uh, perusal tonight. Thank you. Mr. Deering didn't have an opinion as to what the right number would be for him to feel that there's not congestion? He didn't offer a number. The only thing I would add is they are currently allowed um, by their existing special use six vehicles, um, and that does not require any employee parking. Uh, so that being said, approving it with eight landscape vehicles and the necessary employee parking potentially could, could clean up the site more than just the six vehicles that are, that are partly, currently part of special use because there's no required employee parking. Um, if they get anything less than, if they go from six to eight, they already have six on there. So I don't know if the applicant would really be willing to go back and review the plan just for, for seven vehicles or six, where that number is. Um, he didn't, but he didn't offer a number. It's really, he's basically, he's, his charge is to review plans, not to offer suggestions to the applicant necessarily. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Mr. Carlisle? Yeah, Mr. Question. Suppose they were to cooperate with one of the neighboring businesses for employee parking and bring a fourth a proposal like that, would that be acceptable in supporting this, their original request? Um, yes, I mean, um, I think we would have to see what, exactly what the negotiation, the, the deal was <coughs> with, with the adjusting neighbor. I, I want to stress that um, special uses are tied, again, to the property. They're not tied to the user. So if we do an, a, a make an agreement with, with this particular special use, it carries on irregardless of who the eventual property owner is. Um, 16, par par 16 employee parking spaces are required by ordinance. If the Planning Commission feels that the applicant has shown sufficient evidence that 16 is not required, the Planning Commission has the right to reduce that number. But again, that number that, that we land on, the Planning Commission lands on, stays in perpetuity with the property. It doesn't go with the owner. So we could have a new owner that doesn't have the maneuverability plan associated, doesn't have the experience with, with the site that this, this applicant apparently has with the site. 
Um, so again, the Planning Commission needs to consider both this particular user, but also the fact that this carries on with the land, not necessarily with the owner. Good point. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Just yes, Mr. Grant. Uh, since Mr. Deering isn't here, uh, I guess I'll voice it to Brent. If we reduce the employee parking, would that make it maneuverable enough, not enough space to make it maneuverable for eight uh, landscape vehicles? It's, I know, sorry to put you on the spot. You haven't done the, you know, it was Mr. Deering's report, not yours. But any, any thoughts on that, at least? When you say, so reduce the required number of spaces is what you're saying? Right. Uh, you, you would essentially be granting, uh, granting a, um, some relief, administrative relief, essentially a parking reduction. Um, it would, it would uh, I think it would help. I think his, his concern, his concern was really with kind of the, one of, the, one of us came up with the term, the ballet of kind of, uh -huh. and not necessarily with this, per, I think, I think, I think the app, this particular applicant has demonstrated, at least in my opinion, kind of a confidence that he can get this done. Um, but the concern is if he, you know, if, if he's no longer running the company or if he sells to another company and are they gonna be as, as, as professional? Um, to answer your question, uh, it would, it would if, if the number of parking spaces were reduced and the applicant were able to get all the employees on the site with fewer vehicles, it would have helped the situation, yes. Thank you. Mr. Stratt. Yeah, I've got a question for Brent, if I may. Uh... Are we requiring all this to be actually striped? No. What happens if they are over by one car, two cars? Who's going to police it, and how are we going to know the difference? Well, much like the Midwest Metals that was before us, I'm not sending my guys out here every morning to count, to count trucks and count cars. That's not going to happen. So how is it policed? It's policed through... Um, one of my guys driving by and happening to notice that it's overparked, or uh, the, the police are driving by and they see a number of cars parked in the street, or one of their neighbors says there's 15 car, there's 15 trucks here, or what have you. So it's through like other like other issues. It's through kind of eyes on the street from various sources. Well, I understand that, but if I may, Mr. yes, uh, I, I understood that, but I, I my concern is is that you know we can impose any kind of restrictions we want. But obviously, the user is going to actually determine whether or not he can turn around or not turn around. I mean, he's not going to do something that he can't communicate. Now, I'll grant you the one comment you made, though. If he does park on the street, there's a problem. I, I, I grant you that. But he can park on the street even if he doesn't have any cars in there or maybe one or two cars in there. So I, I find it kind of difficult to uh, impose it, but certainly, the zoning ordinance is a zoning ordinance, and I don't mind complying with it. Uh, you know, I'm saying we should comply with our zoning ordinance. So if it's up to us to make that determination, let's do so. But I'm having difficulties in understanding exactly. You can't possibly legislate every possible condition, is my point. And that's when I, I mentioned that several times. It's impossible to do or close to impossible. But uh, so be it. Thank you. Any other Comments for staff for Mr. Carlisle. There's a petitioner in the audience. Good evening, Nathan Robinson, Horizon Engineering with uh, Mr. John Warness of United Ventures. And I'd like to start off the same way I started off the last time we were here with a question. Um, with regards to the parking, the ratio of employee vehicles to work trucks, we've got a, we've agreed to a, at least on the site plan, a two to one ratio. And I know it's been mentioned that that's out of the ordinance, but is that actually in the ordinance? I thought that was a, basically a comfortable number that we arrived at because I, I, I think essentially if we can reduce the number of employee vehicles from 16 to 14 or 12, whatever the, whatever the number is, it's going to help the situation because I think the trapping engineer's um, concern is maneuverability, particularly for maybe the second row of vehicles. So whether it's eight trucks or five trucks, it's that last row there. And he's looking at it in the situation where you've got all the employees parked there at the same time. And as we've discussed in, in uh, previous meetings, that that's 
not really the way that United is going to run this operation. It's going to be a staged operation where you have staggered start times in the morning. Likewise, at the end of the day, you're going to have staggered times when the vehicles are arriving at the end of their shift. So that is not their intent to have all of the vehicles parked there while the trucks are trying to get in and out, essentially. And while we realize that's specific to United's use, we can't say what's going to happen in the future with another user. The other thing to consider is that we, on the site plan, we've agreed to this ratio. And again, if we can reduce it, so be it to help our cause. But it could be less than whatever number we agreed to, 16, 14, 12, whatever it is, it could be actually less than that because we've mentioned that the United oftentimes employs the use of passenger vans to bring their employees. So in the best case scenario, we have two passenger vans with 12 employees and th that's it. You know, you do the math and that, that they'll take care of all eight trucks. Chances are it's not gonna happen with just two passenger vans, but it's very likely that he could ha at least have one passenger van and you make up the rest with individual cars and it's, you know, we're looking at a number of eight to maybe 10 employee spaces. So we feel that the number of work trucks, eight, that's the number we're shooting for. We, we had 11 in the past. He's currently, um, under the previous approval, he's got a number of six that we're working with. It's, it, as it was mentioned, is it really worth our time and trouble to come back and ask for seven or six? <laughs> uh, we feel that eight, eight is a comfortable number. Um, in order to achieve that, if we have to reduce the number of employee spaces, uh, we're willing to do that because in all honesty, 16 spaces is probably a few cars too much. But we were working with that ratio that we agreed to that. Brent, Brent can you just help us? How did that ratio get arrived at, or Mr. Carlisle? The ratio is that in the schedule of parking regulations, there's no contractor's yard parking ratio requirement. So with that, we based it off similar like uses, which were based at maximum employee count, back basically maximum employees at largest shift. Um, based on eight vehicles, we assume two passengers a vehicle, that's 16 employees at one time, so we did a one-to-one -one ratio, one, one parking space per one employee. So that's how we got to the 16 number. It was based on two employees per truck, maximum, maximum occupancy of 16 total on the site. You still feel comfortable with that approach? based on everything we've discussed over the last several meetings? 16, I, I, will, I will say that 16 spaces is a very conservative okay. requirement. All right, thanks. Mr. Strat, or, I'm sorry, Mr. Schultz. <laughs> you guys look so much alike. You know? Yeah, <laughs> sure. You're in trouble now. <laughs> Question for the petitioner. Your vehicles are in fact crew cabs, correct? Uh, some are standard, some are super cab, some are extended cab. And based on what Ben just said, assuming he's assuming 16 employees, if you have eight crew cabs, I'm assuming you're going to have 24 employees because you're not going to be running crew cabs unless you need them to seat employees. Well, currently, yeah, just because we have crew cabs doesn't mean that we're having you know four or five people in a crew cab. Um, the typical crew makeup is three people, you know, as, as an average, anywhere from two to four. Um, but our vehicles are set up to accommodate, you know, kind of whatever we have. So, so eight vehicles at three each, or yeah, eight vehicles at three people each um, is 24 people. Uh, I, that's your average crew. So I don't think the parking is unreasonable. Well, remember, we, we're shuttling 15 people in, um, in and out on a daily basis. In a passenger van. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Excuse me. Could you repeat that? that oh, I'm sorry. We're, we're shuttling in 15 people in a passenger van, um, in and out. <coughs> so you don't use the crew caps then? Oh no, what I mean is, uh, you know, bringing <coughs> in uh, to work as far as cars in the parking lot. There wouldn't be. We're we're shuttling in 15 people in one passenger van, in and out on a daily basis. You know, they, where they're not they're not driving cars into the site. Is, is it safe to say that you would you would be shuttling people in? I mean, if we said you could only have 12 parking spaces, you're going to need more than 12 people to run the eight vehicles. 
would it be safe to say you would be shuttling in whatever you needed beyond the allowable Absolutely. parking? Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Kempen, did you have a comment or a question? Okay. Mr. Schultz. So you currently have <clears throat> you currently have six trucks on the vehicle on the property, and you shuttle 15 people in to fill those six trucks. I'm not exactly sure on the count, but it's probably between between 10 and 15. Okay, and then you also have drivers or crew bosses that come in and park on the property? Correct. So we can figure six people are going to park and you're going to shuttle 15 in. So you got 21 people for six trucks. Well, currently there's probably 18 total people. Okay. Mr. Edmonds? Yeah, my only concern is this goes with the land once we approve this, correct? Yes. yes. So we may not always find someone in the future who is quite so facile, so to speak, to, as to maneuver in this property. What was, what, was the, what was this lot approved for before? Was it only six vehicles? That's a question for Yes. Us. I think we got to be careful about how much we allow here because we're allowing that for the future. But where is the give? Is it the give in the employee parking or the give is in the trucks? Is that, there is, therein lies a balance. Um, and, you know, I mean, again, if, if, we're, if the special use approval is predicated on a certain number of parking spaces, whether it's this company or the next company that buys this property, right. that's all they'll be able to park on there. Well, I think the applicant has said that they're willing to uh, accept even eight or 10 parking spaces, I would certainly uh, be in congruent with that uh, proposal. If I could, um, just kind of can I jump in? Sure. Um, to make sense of what we're doing there, we need a minimum of eight crew vehicles to make it an efficient operation. As far as um, employee parking, I don't want to get into a situation, and I'm just, I'm being honest here, I don't want to get into a situation where I accept eight parking spaces and the next thing you know I have to park 12 vehicles. We're very, com I, I'm very comfortable with eight crew vehicles and um, 13, 14 spaces. I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. I know in the past, if you look at the aerials where um, by spending time with the, with the um, city planner and stuff, talking about what's gone on in the past and seeing all the tractor, um, the tractors that were in that site, there could have been 15 to 20 tractors at one point in time and cars parked around, the site not being screened, the site not looking um, like it was in good order. It's, it's, I guess I just gotta say, it, it just seems like what we're trying to accomplish here is just, it's, um, I don't know, I guess a little bit discouraging. You know, I mean, I know what we need. We need eight, eight crew vehicles. We wanna run a respectful operation. We don't want to have issues down the road. Eight truck and trailer combinations and 13 or 14 spaces. We feel very comfortable operating with that. And I, I think that that's a good game plan for what we have going on there. And I think the way that Nathan put it together with the, with the vehicles parked on both sides, it gives us a lane to back, to back up when we're pulling out in the morning time and getting out and stuff like that. I mean, I think it's a great game plan. Mr. Shepke, did you have your yeah, comment? Yeah, I'm a little concerned. Uh, first of all, uh, you said uh, backing out in the morning, or no? I'm you're pulling, you're pulling in at night, and how are you turning them around so that you're pulling out in the morning and not backing up uh, the street there on Birchwood? I'm worried about traffic congestion on Birchwood, and that's such a small lot to turn that that crew cab and that trailer around on, uh, especially if you've got 12 to 16 passenger cars sitting there. It doesn't look to me like you have enough room to, uh, to function properly uh, unless somebody is just an amazing backer-upper with, uh, <laughs> with their equipment. If, well, I can, if I can make a couple of yeah. comments. Um, that was part of the reason we put the maneuvering plans together was to illustrate that because this operation is staggered in terms of start times and end times, that you're not gonna have a situation where the parking lot's full and you're gonna have all eight work trucks arrive at the end of the day. So the idea is you'll have all the employee vehicles there and the first truck comes in, 
pulls straight into the site and makes a 180 degree U-turn on site, and we know that works. Yep. We can be technical and show that line work on the drawings and use the programs, but we did it in the field. He took the truck and trailer combination be before we even came here for the first meeting and made that maneuver and it worked. So we know in reality that that works. Um, so you have those initial trucks come in, they have plenty of space to do their 180 degree <coughs> park the, say the first row, half that lot's going to clear out with the employee vehicles, it opens up more space for the next row to pull in there. So um, all the trucks will be facing south at the end of the day, so the next morning employee vehicles arrive. What he meant by backing up is that on, in, their, in their space, they're gonna pull straight back and then they're gonna maneuver and then pull straight out. So the backing up is actually occurring on site on the property. It, that second bank of, of trucks is the one that worries me the most. Uh, when you have full capacity in there, and uh, any scenario, you have to base it on full capacity. If we're approving it for full capacity, even though you might not ever operate that way, somewhere down the line, it's gonna be approved for that, and that's something that, that we have to, uh, Murphy's Law, we have to take about everything we possibly can into consideration when we're, when we're uh, looking at this. And I believe that's what Mr. Deering was arriving at in his comments, was looking at it in terms of that. And that's why we feel that if we take that number 16 and reduce it to 14, um, there'll be, if you look at the site plan, right now actually the site plan shows 18 employee spaces, so you can automatically take off two. If you take off another two spaces, there's enough space for those trucks to back up, swing around in between the aisle and pull out. Uh, I think Mr. Warnes feels confident that, that he can accomplish that. And uh, I think that's really the key is just reducing the number of employee parking spaces to make this feasible. And I believe also looking towards the future that it does set a limit on any future user, the numbers are there. Number of work trucks, number of employee vehicles, if it works for a future user, fine. If it doesn't, then the next person comes in. Yes, Mr. Schultz. After listening to all of this, Brent made the comment that these parking places are in fact not going to be striped. So, I'm wondering if we're making a lot of noise here. Um, I don't have a problem with eight work vehicles and the fact that they have to provide space for 16 parking places. And if they only use 10 of the 16 and they use the ones to the back of the property so that they have lots of room to move their trucks around, I have no problem with it. But I think it's our responsibility to protect the city in the future. And if the consultant and the planning director and the traffic engineer feel that the proper mix for this property is eight trucks and 16 employee parking places, I don't, I'm not gonna be comfortable saying, well, we only need 10 parking places for eight trucks. I, I think as long as we limit the number of work rigs to eight and tell them that they have to provide parking sufficient for 16 cars, we make everybody happy. Yes, Mr. Crent. Uh, I just want to second Mr. Schultz's comments. I think, um, again, if the eight doesn't bother me, the eight uh, work vehicles, the idea of 16 now, because this, this becomes in per perpetuity, it, perpetuity, it doesn't stop. Now there's the next person can then park 16 employee vehicles on that lot. I mean, they're gonna know when they buy it, they're allowed that much, that's their limit. Um, if they can't make it work, they're not gonna buy the property. <clears throat> so um, I, I, don't see, I don't have a problem with this at, six, at 16 employee, employee cars. Mr. Kemp? <clears throat> yeah, I, I really don't see uh, an issue with, with the amount of employee parking and stuff, especially considering that the nature of the business and uh, typically you would be picking people up in a carpool fashion because they're going out as a team anyway. They have the same arrival and departure times. Uh, I do have a question, however, on the, like the landscape materials bins at the back of the yard. And uh, I was wondering if you have a <coughs> process that you plan to use. Are you gonna be loading up your work trucks from those landscape bins? Because mm. it looks like they're kind of impeding into those parking spots as well. 
Do you have an explanation on that? Uh, the idea with the last, those are not going to be used during the day, so they will be loading the materials into the work vehicles first thing in the morning. Um, so once the employee vehicles are there, they're not going to be accessed. And the flip side of that is this scenario ultimately is going to change anyways in the wintertime. This is worst case scenario, truck trailer combinations, summertime operations. So once we get into the winter conditions, we're looking at a smaller footprint for the for the work truck. So there's the parking configuration is probably going to be a lot different. So in the winter months, there may be a need to access those bins for salt and uh, there will be plenty of space in that situation. So we're, we're, we're confident that the uh, landscape bins can be accessed. Okay. I guess I have one follow-up question for staff. If they do decide to be changing this, there's no requirements for where the parking is and stuff. If this, if this is submitted, that kind of shows where the vehicles are at. But if they decide a better layout configuration is okay, it's acceptable. Well, no, they really should stick to the stick to the plan. But I think I think what he's indicating is in the, is a win, in the winter months it's going to be this is a the, the summer months is a worst case scenario. In the winter months it'll be this, but much less. The trailers will be gone. What they uh, what John indicated was they take the trailers, they service them, and I think it was Washington Township. So it's just going to be trucks with blaze on the front. So even if there's eight, there's going to be it's going to be less because there's no trailers, and there's going to be uh, one person per per truck rather than three. So there's going to be less of a footprint for employee parking. So they'll still park in generally the same area. There'll just be less area taken up by parking. Is that accurate? Yes, basically. Mr. Strat. Yeah. You know, I, I have no problem with uh, what is being presented either. And uh, as I said before, it, I understand that. Uh, this variance goes with the land, but the probabilities of this being reused, a new owner coming in and using it for parking, I think it's going to be pretty dug on slim. I think it'll probably be a building or something else that's going to go on top of this. So to me, I, I think what's, what there's being proposed, I think, is reasonable, and certainly I would go along with that. Mr. Schultz? I'm not worried about, I'm no. not worried about the future. The, the landscape bins, is there going to be a bobcat or something on site to take material in and out of there? In the wintertime, for sure. So that'll take up one of your employee parking spaces? Probably? In the wintertime, yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions for the petitioner? Yes, Mr. Carlisle. I, I failed to mention one thing I wanted to bring to the Planning Commission's attention. Um, the applicant has shown a porta potty on site. It's not required by code. Um, they, it's located in the northeast corner of the parcel. If the Planning Commission is in favor of granting this, um, we've talked to the applicant about this facility and whether or not they need it or not. They are open to the Planning Commission's recommendation if they should be required to have one or not. Now we're getting to the minutia. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I think that's a little bit out of our purview, and maybe the building codes would, would be more applicable. No, there's no building code issue for this. Um, one of our concerns was um, because their a contractor's yard is required to have a building, um, they received a variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals, so they didn't have to have a building on the site. One of the reasons for a building is for nothing else is for employee restrooms. Um, one of our concerns was where are the employees going to use facilities. They were going to use it off site. The applicant said, well, we can put a porta potty on the site, but we there's no building code requirement for this. It's really at the discretion. It's a site plan issue at this point. And do the planning commission want That's want a it twist on it. What's that? That's a twist. Site planning <laughs> issue for a porta potty. Just what you wanted that's what you signed up for, right? When you joined the planning commission? <laughs> See I'm, I'm this one right here. Well, thank you they're for sharing banking. that, Mr. Carroll. You're welcome. <laughs> and it looks like they're going to be banking into the street. That's what bothers me. <clears throat> any, other, any other comments or questions for the petitioner, Mr. Edmonds? Well, <clears throat> my own personal opinion, I, I would have agreed with the two uh, ZBA members who voted against this, the senior members, uh, in terms of the variance. However, we're at the point where we are now, and I don't have, I think, Porta potty should be there. You know, we all can't predict accidents. You know, so, <laughs> so I just think it should ought to be there. And I think back in the in the future, since uh, 
future uh, landowner doesn't have to put an office up there, then uh, I think at a minimum a porta potty is fine, but it certainly has to be serviced. All right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in favor of the porta potty. Thank you. Would you like to have a seat? Thank you. Again, the public hearing was closed on this item, but if there's anyone in the audience who would like to make a comment, please step forward. Seeing no one, gentlemen, what's your pleasure? Mr. Edmonds. I will move the resolution as proposed with one more, <coughs> with one condition. Resolve that special use approval and preliminary site plan approval for the proposed United Ventures II LLC, west of John R., north of <coughs> 1861 Birchwood, section 26, currently zoned IB Integrated Industrial and Business District, be, po well, be approved uh, with the following condition that the, uh, the porta potty be uh, established on the site as proposed and on the print and uh, maintained. All right, thank you. Mr. Schultz? No, I won't second that. I'll second. Mr. Stratt seconds Me that discussion. I think if we're going to do a proposal or an approval resolution, because we weren't provided one on our package, it has to contain the verbiage that we are approving for eight work vehicles and 16 parking places. Otherwise, all we're getting is a porta potty sitting in the middle of a piece of land. I would amend the motion to include that then. <coughs> the eight work, work trucks and the. Uh... Eight work trucks and trailers, maximum, and, and a minimum of. 16 parking places. Mr. Stratt, will you second that motion? Yes, Perfect. maximum of 16 parking. Is that clear? Is it a maximum of 16? Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, okay. one clarification, does that mean they can do less than 16? Or is it 16 the number? They need to provide a minimum of 16 parking places. It's a minimum. Okay. Yes, thank you. It's a minimum. Okay. Ready? I believe so. Mr. Sanzika? Yes. Mr. Shepke? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Stratt? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Kempen? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Are you leaving us? Yes. All right, next item, uh, item number seven. It's another special use and preliminary site plan review file number SU407, the proposed 1 800 mini storage east side of Rochester, south of Waddles, 3846 Rochester, section 23, currently zoned GB, general business district. Yes, thank you. Um, the applicant tonight is before, before the Planning Commission proposing a five-story, 69-foot-high, tall self-storage facility located at 3846 Rochester Road. Um, this facility would c contain approximately 775 storage units. Um, self-storage self is a special use in the general business district. The building does comply with all height, setback, and bulk requirements in the GB district. Um, however, this item was first considered by the Planning Commission at the May 14th meeting, and at the May 14th meeting, the item was continued um, based on input from two different issues. The first was the impact upon the adjacent single-family residential properties to the east, <coughs> as well as the compatibility along Rochester Road. Um, since that meeting, the applicant has revised their site plan and submitted it for planning commission approval. Um, in regards to the impact upon the adjacent residential, the applicant has done um, really three things. Um, the first is they have agreed to remove all building-mounted lights that are located along the east elevation. 
they've agreed to, to, to mount them on poles and shine internally into the site. The second thing the applicant has done is they've removed all windows along the east elevation so there will be no windows that face the single family residential properties. Um, and the third item they've done is they've agreed to preserve a 10 foot landscape buffer along the east property line. <coughs> um, within that landscape buffer they have agreed to preserve um, nine mature elms as well as mulberry. Uh, the elms and mulberry are not a um, normally a preserved tree. However, they do provide approximately 45 to 40, 40, 40 foot to 45 feet of screening to the existing properties. Um, in addition to that, to the preservation of those nine trees, they've also agreed to complement that landscaping with approximately 23 Norway, Norway spruces that will be planted between 12 and 14 foot in height at their initial planting. Um, this, will, this will give um, basically com complete screening to a 12 foot height along the entire length of the east uh, elevation or east property line. In addition, the applicant has agreed to replace the existing concrete wall um, in that facility and location. They have given us a tree preservation um, plan as well as tree preservation techniques to ensure that they do preserve those elm and mulberry trees, uh, trees along the, the elevation there. Um, so within a combination of the, of the, the existing landscaping and the proposed landscaping, um, there is sufficient screening um, from a landscaping perspective. In addition, they did provide an angle study which shows that uh, the top of the building will not be visible from any of the rear um, residential property yards. Really, the sight line begins in the middle of those, basically of those houses or along the sidewalk in front of those houses where the sight line for the top of that building exists due to the existing mature landscaping. Um, the second issue is, is regards to the compatibility along Rochester Road. Um, as required, the applicant did provide a massing study to show how this development um, <laughs> is in relation to the existing development pattern along Rochester Road. We do want to note that the general business or GB district is the most intense commercial development district um, in the city. And the, the GB district was intended to provide um, intense development as a city, city or regional wide scale, as well as allow development flexibility moving forward. I do want to note that all the GB parcels along Rochester Road and most of the G, GB parcels, uh, zone parcels in the city, do are, are adjacent to single family residential. So this is not a unique circumstance for this particular property. Um, as such, a buy right development such as a hotel, an office, a restaurant um, could uh, apply all those bulk regulations and bulk standards and be afforded the same height and bulk, bulk regulations that this applicant is proposing. The reason this is under uh, additional review is due to the self storage uh, special use requirements and the impact of the self storage use. So I think the Planning Commission, when considering the proposed development, needs to consider the intents of the GB district as well as what is existing along Rochester Road. Um, a five story development would increase the development potential along Rochester Road and is more compatible to what we envision in or intend for Rochester Road than what's existing on the one, the one story and two story nature of the development. So this. Um, this design and this intensity is more envisioned with what the intent was along, along the, uh, along in the in the general business along Rochester Road. The application has been reviewed in consideration of both the special use standards in 9.02 as well as the self storage requirements in 6.24, um, and we do find that the applicant has made all reasonable attempts to address both the issue of uh, compatibility with the single family residential as well as compatibility along Rochester Road. So in summary, we find that the GB zoning is intended to provide for more diverse and intense development. This application is consistent with those requirements as well as all necessary bulk setback and height requirements. Um, and we find the application has met the required standards and we do recommend approval. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Carlisle? Mr. Edmonds. Just one question, um, maybe it's for Mr. Savadon. In the community business, this at one time was a community business district, is that correct? As opposed to general business in the previous zoning ordinance? And what? And I guess my question is, was there a difference in height then than there is now? There was, I, my memory says it was, uh, I'm, I, I wanna say it was the general business, the GB, regardless, I'm, I'm, I'm I don't, I don't want to debate, but the, the height, I'm, I'm positive about the height. The height was a maximum of three stories or 40 feet. So in April of 2011, there was, there was uh, we combined a number of districts and went from four, four commercial districts down to two. And, and um, the height was increased from 
maximum of three stories and 40 feet to a maximum of five stories and 75 feet for the, with the intent that Mr. Carlisle indicated in his presentation. And just to follow up, and that was, uh, there were re numerous public hearings held regarding that uh, change in the ordinance. Yeah, there, was, there were um, over 30 public meetings, a number of public hearings, public input session. Um, I, could, I could drone on and on, but there was a, um, uh, a number of opportunities for the public to, to comment on the draft document. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Carlisle staff? Petitioner here, I'd like to step forward. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Joe Guido. I'm the project architect. Well, um, ben has done a good job uh, explaining what we've done since our last meeting. We've really took every, taken every comment that we heard at the commission's last meeting and tried to incorporate those into the revised plan. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Guido. Could you pull the microphone over a little I'm bit sorry. just so everyone can hear? <coughs> sorry about that. You want me to restate my name? Did everyone, can everyone hear that or? No, no could you start over again? Okay. Uh, my name is Joe Guido. I'm the project architect. Um, and we've basically tried to uh, incorporate all of the concerns that the commission had at the last meeting. Uh, that Ben has uh, individually addressed in his uh, presentation. We did add, uh, we retained the 10 foot landscape strip in the back, added some evergreen planting for screening. Uh, I've provided, I don't know if you were given the massing model. Yes, we, we were. Okay, so you don't need to see that again. No. Okay, so we tried to show what it would be in context with the existing buildings. Uh, so basically, um, if there's any questions, I would be more than happy to address those individually. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? I want to tell you, appreciate the supplemental information. It was, it was helpful. I, 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 no problem at all. No questions? <coughs> Have a seat. Okay. Thank you. Again, this is another item where the public hearing has been closed. However, I will entertain comments from the audience. Um, if you would like to make any, please come forward. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Could we request that things that were discussed during the public hearing not be rehashed, but new information be brought forward? Sure, absolutely. Everything that was said last meeting has been recorded. It's on record. So we'd appreciate if you keep your comments to any new items. As I wasn't at that hearing, I wouldn't be able to know what was already discussed, sorry. My name is Bill Genuine. I live at 1274 Tennyson, a street that is perpendicular to the residential street that the mini storage is gonna be behind, which was uh, Hawthorne and Judy. Uh, my friend is passing out um, a representation of what that might appear to look like from the front for the residents who live along Hawthorne and Judy. Um, that is a, not a, a a accurate drawing, but it's an approximation using the existing mini storage building that is on Maple. As you can see, it still can be visible from the street and in the backyard. It would even be more obtrusive. Uh, the trees that are approximately three stories tall don't uh, completely cover that. Even if you planted new trees, it would take decades for them to grow tall enough to obstruct the view. Um, it's ironic that uh, Rochester Road has a zoning for five stories when it's adjacent to residential properties, whereas Maple Road, which is industrial and business district with the existing mini storages, is limited to four stories. There's no residential anywhere along Maple where uh, these properties are built. Um, I asked the commission if this picture is represented, how would you like to have that uh, visible in your backyard? Think hard about the, you know, your own personal experience. The people who purchased these homes purchased them maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago when the zoning was only three stories and nothing on Rochester was taller than two stories and were happy to be living there. Uh, start putting in these larger uh, monstrosity buildings and the property values are gonna plummet for those homes along that stretch, which then is going to affect the homes that are adjacent, such as my home. Um, I would hope that the commission might reconsider. I know it sounds like it's almost a foregone conclusion that this is going to be approved, but 
Um, the people who live in this subdivision uh, every day are concerned that this large type of building is going to propagate and we're going to be a living equivalent of uh, um, the other side of Troy where there's large buildings up against the subdivisions. Uh, thank you. Any questions? I don't have any comments for you. Thank you, sir. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is John Robertson. I live on Hawthorne Street, 3705. And uh, I wanted to comment uh, uh, being opposed to this new uh, proposal, uh, mainly for various reasons, but one that's really on my mind is the shadow effect of this building. And I'm looking at the, uh, the plan. I've seen it for the first time this, this evening. But if the building is 69, 75 feet high, when the sun is setting in the west at maybe 30 degrees, not even setting, but it's some hour of the, later in the day when the sun is setting in the west, it's going to cast a shadow that's, if it's 30 degrees up from the horizon, it's going to cast a shadow that's uh, about 120 feet long. It, as the sun continues to set, it will cast a shadow that will continue to grow down to even like 200 or 250 feet. Um, now, I don't live directly behind that, but I live not too far from it, but I can't imagine living in that shadow for many, many, many hours um, <clears throat> of, of the day. And that plus in the wintertime when the sun is you know, favoring the south, then many of the other houses that are around the curve onto Judy will also be in the shadow of that building. And uh, I agree with, with my friend that um, the people that bought here should have the expectation of having something similar behind them that was there when they moved in. You know, if, if they moved in next to a, a junkyard, then they would have had to have accepted, accepted that fact. Um, I also wanted to ask a question of, about the, uh, the minutes from the last meeting. It was briefly stated that there was a petition that was presented. It, it didn't say anything about if the petition was uh, for this or against this. It didn't say how many signatures were on that petition. I'd like to know if you have that information. We could be. Yeah, the city does. I don't have it at my disposal. So if you'd like to contact the city tomorrow, um, they could certainly give you that information. Mr. Okay. Savinant, you have that still Absolutely. on file? Absolutely. If you, uh, if you call and you can provide me with your email address, I can provide you with an electronic copy of the petition. petition. And there was a, some revi there was a revision that was handed in um, recently that had some additional signatures on it. I can provide that to you as well. Okay, I believe there's probably someone here this evening that can actually answer that question if you don't have it right at hand. I don't have it at the, to at the tip okay. of my tongue, and I'm confident that you're right. Also, also, there were I know there were multiple emails sent that was in opposition to this proposal. Mine was at least mine was one of them, and I was just wondering if there's a record of, of a count of people that have sent emails opposed to this. A copy of all the emails are on the agenda that every, every Planning Commission member is looking at right now. I, I could count for you, but um, the, every email that was provided is, is in the packet. Okay, I didn't see my email in that packet from the last meeting. My, my email was not in that packet from the last meeting. From the last meeting? Yes. Well, they would have received it at the last meeting. Will it be in this packet then? I. Uh, Oh, you're saying one since the last meeting are in that packet? Yes, correct. Okay. So my email would have been in last meeting's packet? Correct. Okay, I looked at last meeting's packet online and it didn't have my email in it. Well, when did you send it? Earlier that day. The, of the previous meeting? Yes, the, whatever that was, the 28th? Then it, then it would have been, it would have been, if it was earlier that day, it would have been handed out to the, uh, to the members at the table. They would have had a hard copy in front of them. Okay. Um, I have a question about the, the offshoot area. Uh, is there a plan for <coughs> some type of outdoor storage, such as RV or trailer storage at this site? Mr. Carlisle? No, there's not. And uh, outdoor storage is a separate special use. So if they actually want to do outdoor storage, they would have to come back in front of the Planning Commission with a public hearing with notification to do that. So public uh, outdoor storage is not part of this proposal. Okay, because their, their facility on Maple Road does have extensive outdoor RV storage. 
that this facility would not have outdoor storage. Okay. Uh, well, basically, I just want to express my opposition to this because I just think it does not suit the, the, the area. It does not uh, fit the theme of the area. And uh, I think it's really a mistake to put this here where there are probably multiple other sites that are near or in industrial areas that would be just as useful. All right, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Um, I'm Kimberly Flagg at 1219 Judy Drive, Troy, Michigan. And I'd like to indulge the Planning Commission if I could. Um, I have a flash drive of photos my husband took. And he does have, he did have architectural design. Um, so I don't know if you can use this and put it on a computer to look. I also have hard copies that um, he did. So I don't know which would be better for Probably you. Probably the hard copies. Okay, You'd I'd like, like to pass these around <coughs> And this, <you>. Mr. <coughs> I believe it's incumbent on myself to protect the residential taxpayers on a significantly impact on the residential values of our homes. Um, number one, you can see going a mile and a half north and a mile and a half south, there is no building three stories or higher. Even if you drive out to South Boulevard, same thing. Um, the other thing you said, or was indicated, general business intense development. Okay, that was in April 2011. Do you know how many of those residents have lived there for over 25 years? And myself, when I thought about building, I came to the city and I looked and they said nothing more than three stories would be built on Rochester Road. I got that from the Planning Commission. They never said it could be changed. I never got a postcard to the effect of those 30 hearings you spoke about. None of the residents did. And now that you're talking about a five-story storage facility, which I believe may be for businesses that have files and stuff, all along that corridor, most of those are small business owners. They're not going to use that site. That site would be more apropos at 16 Mile, 15 Mile, Northfield, Parkway and Crooks, those buildings are five, six stories. They have many businesses in there. I've worked there. Most of those buildings, buildings would use that facility. <coughs> but I'm gonna tell you right now, 12 to 14 foot spruces are gonna take 20 to 30 years to grow. I planted them 20 years ago. That's how long it's taken. A lot of those deciduous trees, are only with leaves for seven months. The rest of the months, they're bare. We're gonna have that building with a shadow casted, and I understand, according to this planning commission, that you can't legislate to monitor those trees. It was just told by Mr. Savinant he doesn't have the, the, the uh, workforce to do that, I understand. However, when I built, when my home was built and the subdivision behind Judy, I was told by the planning commission and also by the developer that they would save as many trees as they could. You know what happened? There wasn't one city planning commissioner out there when they were doing the trees. They cut 
every single tree down other than the cottonwoods that are along the back wall, which could have been cut. So I don't want to hear it will be monitored because it never was. The other thing you had mentioned, the satellite dish erected at 17 Mile in Rochester Road. We were told that the deciduous trees that were there, we'd never see that satellite. We do see that satellite. Those deciduous maples, when they're out, they lose their leaves. We see them. You don't think we're going to see this five-story building? I don't think it's right that the Planning Commission has the right to change the general business for people who have lived there for over 25 years. Our taxes are high there. And we, all we ever get is approval for other things. You don't ever take into consideration the money we've spent to landscape our property. I don't have any problem with him with a business, but it could be well suited somewhere else and there should be no more than a three-story facility plus. We don't know the property adjacent to that, that he wouldn't put an outdoor storage facility there. The traffic on Rochester Road, number one, is horrible. The traffic that comes out of there will be worse. Drive Rochester Road sometime between three and six. It's not easy to go. And the woman that was here at the last meeting, she was very concerned about that. And so I am, I am totally opposed to this. I hope you will take this all under consideration and I believe it should be situated somewhere else or make it three stories because those trees are going to take over 30 years to grow. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Yes, Mr. Schultz. If I could just clarify, the Planning Commission has no control over what the Planning Commission never would have said 20 or 25 years ago that the building height was limited to three stories. It may have been someone in city administration, but it was not the Planning Commission. The uh, Planning Commission does not enforce tree regulations. If a developer said they were going to leave trees, it's up to the developer, not the Planning Commission. And the Planning Commission did not change the zoning ordinance. The City Council changed the zoning ordinance. And why were the residents informed of this? You were. There, there was public notices all oh, put out in the, it, all right. Anyone else like to speak to this, this matter? Um, uh, <coughs> Mark Desidos, 3819 Hawthorne. Um, I also have a comment about the, um, the zoning change. Um, I talked talk to Brent and he notified me that the, um, the notification was sent out through media. Um, and I didn't really get any further explanation of what that media means, but you know, if it, we obviously didn't get postcards, but um, you know, if it went out through a newspaper, who, who reads newspapers anymore? You know, I was told, could have been in the Troy Somerset Gazette, um, any of the other smaller newspapers, the notice could have been in there. The only people who read that are, you know, in the coffee shop reading or drinking their coffee, so. I feel the zoning change, there, there wasn't enough thought that went into it, and there wasn't enough input from the, uh, the residents. Um, this will be the first decision under the new zoning. It'll be, this will be, this is it. It's gonna, once the five stories goes up, I mean, we can't go back. What if this business fails? Then we're just stuck with a five foot shelf sitting right there that we gotta look at. Um, I did look up, um, on the internet, the building heights in the city of Troy. If this building went in, this would be the 30th bi biggest, tallest building in the city of Troy. All 29 in front of it are on Northfield Parkway, Crooks Road, Big Beaver. There's nothing on Rochester Road, not one. Um, I also looked on the internet about um, the number of public storage facilities that are in the area because I question the need for this. I just heard today 775 units. That's a lot of units. <clears throat> I counted seven storage facilities within three and a half mile radius of this. Um, I don't hear any big need for storage facilities and 
And since this started, I've actually started paying attention to the storage facilities I see around town. I've never seen a three-story until I saw Maple Road. I've never seen a five-story storage facility in my life. If somebody knows of one, I'd love to go take a look at it. I, I've never heard of such a thing. <clears throat> the traditional storage facility is you drive, you unload your trunk, you shut your thing, and you get out of there. It sounds like this. You got to load your stuff into carts, take elevators up to the top. I know I wouldn't want to do that. I'm, I'm sure I wouldn't. So the, I understand the zoning was changed to encourage mixed use. The, um, the, the problem with that is, and you've mentioned this, the, the businesses along Rochester Road are established. I don't think they're going anywhere. At least I hope they're not. Um, you know, I understand you're looking in the future, but short term, this is going to be the only five-story building that's along there. That's, a, yeah, I don't know of any other vacant lots except for possibly where pro, pro car wash used to be. The, where else would they go along this, this stretch of Rochester Road? Um, the uh, eight-foot high fence that's going to be put up. There's a, currently a six-foot fence. I have a fe um, trees that are up against it. You guys have seen the pictures. I worry that either when that six-foot fence comes out or the eight-foot fence goes in, you're either going to trap my trees or the trees are going to get killed trying to take out the, um, the current fence. Obviously, I want to avoid that because I need that to block you know, if it does get approved. Um, just going to, like they said, with the 12 to 14 foot Norway spruces, that's not, if these trees end up being knocked down, it's not going to block anything for, for numerous years, long time. And um, the only other, I, I got a chance to look at the site plan. The only thing I saw on it that I question is um, the lights, the lack of glare. In the site plan itself, it shows the traditional lights like this. I didn't see anything other than the statement that we wouldn't be getting glare. I don't see how you're blocking glare from lights like that. So that's it. Thanks. Mr. Carlisle, do I remember reading uh, somewhere in the packet that these trees will be planted at the 12 to 14 foot height? They're not they're not smaller trees that are going to grow into this height? No, the 14, 12 to 14 foot is the plant, is the height at planting. Sir, did you hear that? What, sir? The 12 to 14 foot trees are the height at planting. Not, right. It's not going to take 10 years to get them Well, we're that talking high. about a 70 foot building, so. No, all I wanted to do was correct okay. the statement that it's going to take years to get them to 12 to 14 I'm feet. Sorry. That's not I, true. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I understand, yes. I know they're going in at 12 to 14 feet. My point being, in order to adequately block, they're going to need to be taller than that. Sorry. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. evening. My name is Mark Jones. I've lived at the uh, the property there for 22 years, and um, I got to say, I respect the businessman's right to establish a business, um, I have no problem with that. Um, I think it's a good thing. And where, where my property sits, I'm, I'm on the corner, the, the southeast corner. So I'm going to have a direct view. All the landscaping that they're talking about putting in doesn't affect me at all. So I, I'm going to have a really a direct view of this. And it could be worse, I think. Uh, you know, a restaurant, fast food restaurant, drive through, um, that would not be a good thing. My only issue with this is the size of the building. Uh, it, it, it's just going to tower. And um, I would like to know, lighting wise, on the south side of that building at the south elevation, what's What's gonna, what are they going to have for lighting? I would imagine at nighttime they'll have security lighting in that parking area, perhaps. Um, you know, it's, that will probably illuminate my backyard and, uh, and uh, the rooms facing that side of the, of the house. So I, it would be, I would be curious to know what, how that's going to be illuminated, if there is a plan for that. Yeah, there is a plan. Um, Mr. Carlisle, do you remember what the site lighting is along the... I'm, I'm, I'm looking up right, okay. as, right. We, as we speak. And 
I do understand when, when you butt up next to commercial property, there is a certain amount of buyer beware, uh, you know, without a doubt. Um, for 22 years, it's, it's been a pretty sweet place to, to live. Uh, and I appreciate the, the commissions um, and the owner, the, the potential property owner, working together on, on the landscaping. And I, it, shows, it shows me that they're trying to be good neighbors. That's a good thing. Again, it's just the, the size of the building that I think is a, is a problem. The, the, <clears throat> photo, the lighting photometric plan shows three um, pole mounted lights along the south elevation. So three in total along the length of, how long is that building, Joe? So th three light, three pole mounted lights along the 240 length of that. Shining toward the building, correct? No, those those are straight. Those are those are straight down, along the south elevation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Strat. Do we have the photometrics on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know that it doesn't spill out and they're shielded. No, the, the photometric um, plan meets all photometric requirements and all screening. Requirements. And to answer the question is, it really is sh shielding, so it's downward, not at your property. All right. So. And, it, and it looks like it's. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening. Hello, my name is Dave Gotchuk. I live at 1205 Judy Drive, which will border this building. Uh, you used the word screening. Uh, since when does a 14-foot tree screen a 70-foot building? I, and I don't care how long it takes to grow, immediately a 14-foot tree will not screen a 70-foot building. You say the front of the building will be compatible with Rochester Road's environment. I disagree. <laughs> like uh, the lady said, it's, there's not a building over three stories on all of Rochester Road. I can understand why they're putting this, want to put this building on Rochester Road. I mean, Rochester Road is one of the most traveled roads other than Big Beaver in the whole city. Thousands of cars travel north and south on it every day they wouldn't even have to advertise. They would put up this monster of a building and thousands of drivers will see it. I mean, it's, it, it, the whole concept just does not make sense to me at all, at all. We've got a third of our industrial sites in this city are vacant. I mean, there's plenty of room to put one of these facilities there or along Big Beaver, but on Rochester Road, you know, <laughs> they were talking about the sun setting. Well, the people like us that live immediately behind this, well, we'll be in the shade at two o'clock in the afternoon on a summer day, not at no 30 degrees or whatever, which is fine. I understand what the gentleman was saying, but you know, to live in darkness at two in the afternoon is ridiculous when you've got a beautiful sunny day and you've got this monstrosity sitting there blocking everything out. And it's just, it, none of it makes sense to me at all. Not, a, not one bit of this proposal makes sense to me at all. And it doesn't make sense to any one of us sitting here. We're gonna have this building there for the rest of our time in Troy. And for all of us, we plan on staying in Troy a very long time because it's a wonderful city. But I beg of you to make a wonderful decision and turn this building, the proposal for this building down. <laughs> it just, it, it, it's it's mind-boggling that this has even been brought forward here at City Council because I, I can't believe that this is even being considered. And as far as I'm concerned, the businesses along Rochester Road are family businesses. You can zone in any way you want. 
that facility is not a family business. And it's a, and it just just tears me apart that, to think that this could be voted on and this could be okayed. And, and it, it, it's, 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 it's mind boggling. It's, I, I, I can't believe that we're even considering a facility of this nature at that location. And I hope that we can vote on this today and that we don't keep postponing it to the point to where only one of us will be showing up and then uh, everybody will say, well, there's hardly any opposition, so we'll approve it. I'm hoping that we can come to a decision today while we are all sitting here anxiously awaiting what you people think. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm uh, Dave Hummy. I live at 3803 Hawthorne, directly behind the building. And enough comments have been made about the warehouse that's in the wrong place and so forth. I did send you gentlemen photographs of the uh, Norway spruce. I don't know if you all got them. Yes, we did. But uh, we planted trees like that in our yard over 25 years ago. And uh, you saw them, they started out very small. Now, now they're very big. But because of the deciduous trees that Davies Tree Service planted after we moved in, it's got so much shade that it actually killed most of the, uh, the uh, Norway spruce. I, I think you saw evidence of that. Uh, and we've actually had to remove two trees from our yard because they're, they're ugly. They're ugly if they're shaded and uh, don't get the sunshine they're not going to look healthy either. And they, uh, on one site on the internet, I saw these trees grow to perhaps 40 feet wide. And another spot I saw 30 feet wide at maturity. Ours are probably were 20 or 25, but like I say, those the branches, a lot of the lower ones died due to lack of sunlight. And there's going to be even more lack of sunlight now with a large building there. And another thing, if they're providing a 10-foot strip to plant a tree that grows 30 to 40 feet wide, where is it going to go? Is it, is it go into their driveway if they leave the trees there? Or, as I saw in the earlier drawing, it'll be 10, 15 feet into the yards of the property owners. Do they expect us to uh, trim, trim their trees? That's what Davy Tree Service did to us. They planted them right up close to the fence and they're growing over. As you can see, one of my neighbors, they're pushing down the fence, the concrete fence. And uh, I've had to go, of course now, if, if they do have someone there, they won't have all the seedlings, but I've been going back there to uh, trim the three to five foot saplings so we wouldn't have even more trees. But. Like I say, on a 10-foot strip, you're going to have a 30 or 40-foot wide evergreen. It doesn't quite make sense. Maybe they should allow a little bit more room if you don't you know, negate the, as my 
prior speaker said, vote it down today. Let's hope you do. There's plenty of other places. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Ed, ask a question. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hamid, when you planted the spruce trees, what were you expecting from them? Were you expecting shade? We're expecting uh, privacy. Okay. From you, you saw the photos. We could sit there and and look out at you know all the trucks from Davies Tree Service. Did you consider and any what, other kind of tree? Pardon? Did you consider any other kind of tree? Something that was more shade tolerant. Because uh, I heard you say you already had to. Uh, well, we we saw those, you know, the six foot uh, trees. Your yours are a little bigger. You're talking about, but you know they're beautiful, cute. So uh, we planted them. You know, we assume they grow and be healthy. Unfortunately, the uh, person we bought them from is a. Uh, uh, a merchant that was up near uh, near Bordines, and he was shot in his home and robbed. Has nothing to do with this, but uh. my my only point was, we all make decisions about what we plant on our own particular property, and there are both pros and cons. You know, I uh, I can understand the. Uh, Evergreens do produce some privacy fairly, fairly quickly, but there are other selections that, that you know, maybe more columnar or that type of thing that could be a better choice. That, that, uh, and that's, my, my, that's my only point. So I, I think I may have said that something. I think you see, you see them all over, and to use them like a fence, more columnar right. and more narrow. You don't, you don't want a, a trees growing into the neighbor's yard. I don't, I don't think you gentlemen would like that if somebody planted trees. <laughs> they, they did it to us, especially a tree service, so-called service. I don't know what, <laughs> what they were, why they, I already had the trees there. They didn't have to uh, put up more. Okay, well, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Needed to get my flash drive. Sorry. Sorry. Right. Yes, sir. Oh. I won't take up much time because everything's been said. But uh, I live on Judy Drive, just east, back pretty far down the street. We're going to have a good sight line of that building year round. Um, I just want to register the comment that I think that the precedent, and that was said earlier, the precedent that's being set by a five story building in that, on that road, uh, ordinance or not, I think is um, something that ought to be considered because as soon as one goes in, then, you know, the, the, the decision's been made. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. I'm Janice Hummy. I live at 3803 Hawthorne, directly behind the proposed um, many storage. Um, I'm just devastated to think of what is going to be permanently put behind our house. All of our large windows face that direction. Our master bedroom is on the second floor. One of the other bedrooms where I use a computer, I can see out there and already the traffic Big, or rather, um, Rochester Road is backed up because there's a, a traffic light just to the north, and it can be at 1 30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and that traffic is backed up. Even today, when I was driving north on Rochester Road, having come down Big Beaver, at Taco Bell, the traffic was out into Rochester Road. It's very congested now that you've widened the road. I thought that was for beautification. So now you want to put 
this oversized building there? Sure, can be jazzed up a little in the front, but still, it's still a warehouse. Would you allow a furniture store, an appliance store, or whatever, to come to you and say, we want to build a warehouse right there on Rochester Road? Because that's what it is. Now, I have talked to this gentleman. I toured the Maple Road facility, and I asked him various questions. Why do you want to build that huge building on a lot which is typically too small for what you ordinarily build? Because that is not the only facility they have. And his answer to me was, well, we want to be where the nice furniture is. Well, are they going into the furniture business? Anything can be stored there. Mm -hmm. I had an experience with, a, with the one over on um, Big Beaver many years ago, back to 9-11, the day we'll all remember. We were renting a small unit there, and I went over in the afternoon to get something. And there was a, a young gentleman there, and he was trying to get in. His code didn't work. He said, for some reason, my code doesn't work. And I said, well, go to the office and find out what the problem is. He said, the office is closed. Well, the office was never closed at that time of the day. So I punched in my code, and I, he followed me, and I warned him. I said, well, you're not going to be able to get out, being that you haven't put your code in. Well, then I noticed later on that he waited around until finally somebody else that was there left. About a week or so later, I was at the office of the facility, and I mentioned to the manager this unusual situation. And it turned out that the manager was contacted by either the police or FBI that they wanted this to apprehend or talk to this gentleman because one of the storage cards, business cards, was found in a Detroit apartment of some fellows who they felt had an association with these so-called Al-Qaeda people. And so they wanted to, or at least, get this individual so they could talk to him and inspect the facility. Well, upon that individual leaving, the manager who was in the office called, notified the authorities, they stopped him on Big Beaver before he got onto I-75 so that they could question him and then legally inspect the unit. What was there, I have no idea. But it goes to show you have no idea what is being stored in those units, who is renting those units, and the fact that we live directly behind this monster that is all we are going to see out our windows. And as my husband mentioned about the trees, and you questioned him about why he selected a certain tree, I'll tell you, when those trees are smaller, and we bought as large a size as we could, they are a neat-looking little tree. And they actually have sold them as Christmas trees. But when those trees, and what they are talking about, the size that they are planning to use, 12 to 14 feet. That is about the time that those trees start really branching out. Their branches get very heavy, hang very low, and as they do that, the trees, the branches underneath die. And pretty soon you just have these just bare branches sticking out. And we planted our trees 25 years ago, new house, nothing was there. 
but right. then we had to contend with those shabby trees that Davies planted. That your husband told us about, thank you. Okay, I just wanted to, being that this gentleman questioned him as to why we did this or that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I would respectfully ask that the comments be specifically about this project. I appreciate all of your concerns, but try to keep your comments directed to this project. Thank you. My name is Susan DeMar Smith, and I live on 1340 Burns Drive. And um, I'm just, uh, I think everything has been said. I am upset about the fact that it is a five story building. Even though I am not immediately adjacent to the property, I'm down the street, I enjoy my backyard, and I don't wanna be sitting out in my backyard and being seeing this five-story building there. As was brought up, what if the, it doesn't go, then we have an empty building sitting there five stories high. Um, the one thing I love about Troy is that you can pull in off of Main Street and you pull into your neighborhood and it's nice and we don't have all these big buildings around us, and I just, I'm just very upset with the fact that this building is going to be high, if, uh, two stories, three stories, but not five. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Krishna Chalamila. I live in uh, 3787 Ahathorn Drive. I bought, this ho I bought the house just recently, like uh, one year back. So I bought the house in Troy, even though I have a choices to buy in different places. I waited for this house, you know, so long, and then bought the house. Because Troy is a great city, it has a great image, great people live here, right? So. My sincere request is almost everything people said, I don't want to repeat the same thing. My sincere request is please don't make any decisions which effect, damage our city image, actually. So that is my sincere request. Thank, Thank you. Do you. you sign in, sir? Oh, yes. Hello. My name is Joni DeMar. I live at 1205 Judy Drive. And I wanted to go back to the question um, that you said the council is not responsible for enforcing any of the um, uh, the site plan at all. So who oh, wait, is wait, responsible wait. for for making sure that they follow through with the um, bushes and the trees and well, it's that a legal plan. document. There, it's a legal document that they have to abide by, and if it's something that is. Uh, uh, objectionable to neighbors, like if they're not keeping their yards up or if something is damaged and they're not fixing it. Like like Mr. Sobhan said, contact the city and the enforcement people would come out and take a look at it and, and then if, if they don't do anything about it, then the city would take further action. Really? Uh, yes. That's how it works? Yes. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that basically? Well, yeah, yes, and just to back up a step, you, what you said is correct. But to back up a step, if a site plan gets approved, um, that's a preliminary site plan that's approved, and then the, uh, the applicant basically gets to go ahead to design it and get, uh, do the engineering drawings. And when the engineering drawings get approved, they pull building permits they construct. Prior to getting a certificate of occupancy, the planning department does a site compliance inspection to ensure that everything that's proposed on the site plan is completed, including landscaping. So if they propose 25 trees, we go and we check that there's 25 trees. The issue is ongoing, a year, two years, three years, 10 years down the road, when a tree dies, it needs to be replaced. What I said was, I'm not sending my, crew, my guys out there every week to every site to count trees. That's not gonna happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way that we monitor landscaping and other site elements is through complaints, through people noticing things that are, are missing, et cetera. That's what I said. Okay. All right, so you don't have a team that actually enforces. You no, know. we have a team that enforces. My, the team does not go from property to property counting trees on a daily basis. They, the way that we're informed is through people, neighbors saying, hey, there used to be a tree there, the tree died, can you come look? And we go and we, we investigate. Okay, and 
Mr. Chair, if I may yes. just also, th there is a distinction here too. There's city administration, which is city employees, and then there's the planning commission, and there's the city council. Those are all separate. City administration would be doing the enforcement. Okay. Okay, um, I'm really disgusted about this whole um, five-story building possibly going up. I think it's a really bad idea. I think our housing prices, our housing, it's just gonna go down. It doesn't matter how beautiful we make our homes. We're not gonna get the price for it because we'll have this big monstrosity in our backyards. And uh, I'm just not happy about it at all. I think you should totally reconsider. And if you can't, you know, consider giving him a tax break to take his building elsewhere, then you need to consider giving the residents of this area a tax break because they're never going to get the price for their house with this big monstrosity there. I, I would never buy a house with that in my yard. So you need to really think about this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Sir, you've already spoke. Yeah, I, can I just ask a couple questions because I'm just seeing the site plan for the first time. Well, real, real briefly, real briefly. Uh, what I wanted to ask if the window, are those windows across the north side? In the north elevation? I don't know if they are. You'll have to, can you get up to the elevation, Sprint? Because the section that is on the east wall, if that was, glass then anybody standing at that end of that corridor would be able to see down into there's no glass there's no, on the east side yeah, there's no glass so on none at all so none. that would be solid no. okay could you go back to the the plan view again i was seeing what looked like a driveway that comes in from the front and goes around and that one there and comes into the back side there that's real close to the 10 foot buffer so what is that? Is that a driveway where trucks or, or, or customers can drive through the, through yes. the, uh, so is there any type of restriction or, or requirement on the type of vehicles by noise, by uh, emissions, diesel emissions, those kinds of things where it's where within 10 feet of the property line there coming in from uh, the street and entering from the back side or the east side of the building? Those are my questions. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. Evening. Susan Brown, 1261 Judy in Troy. And I just had a question about parking. If, if I heard correctly, 700 and some units. Um, that looks like a very small amount of parking spaces, if I'm seeing it correctly. Well, I, I would be interested in the applicant can fill, can fill in more detail if I miss something. Most of the operations for this facility will be located internal to the building itself. There is a, there is a drive aisle intern the internal to the building where the, the uh, users pull into the building, pull into a dedicated loading area, and then go up to their unit. There are only, I don't know the exact number, but how many units are at ground level on each side of the of the of the first floor? Uh, it's about it's about fifty fifty. The, the tile goes down the middle. No, I'm talking about the, the first floor where you pull up parking. Of the seventy five seven hundred and seventy five units, how many are accessed internally to the building? There's twelve I'm sorry, there's twelve exterior units that are located on the north elevation and divide between the north elevation and the south elevation. The remaining 760 some units are all located internal and they're accessed for the internal drive through the building. Gotcha. So most of the operations is internal to the building. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. I think we're due for a five minute we recess. Have a five minute recess, please.
Thomas Act. All right. Gentlemen, is there any further discussion around our table? Mr. Edmonds. Um, I, I will state, you know, that uh, I, I think it's important that, you know, for even the adjoining residents that we state that no recreational vehicle storage or any kind of vehicle storage will be allowed in that bump out in the back. And I know the consultant has said that, you know, that's a use that would have to come back to the Planning Commission anyway, but I think actually in this case, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not redundant to, to say that. Thank you. Mr. Shepke. Um, I'm really, uh, I really don't uh, like that five-story building there. Uh, I can understand where they can legally do it. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. Um, I remember Southfield, what was all farm fields and stuff like that. And now it's a hodgepodge of buildings, uh, many areas, the zoning didn't do its job. Um, so I have a lot of mixed emotions on this. And uh, anyway, uh, it, it's the law. It's not a good law, but it's, it's uh, when the zoning was incorporated this way, um, I guess it's, uh, it's legal as far as the city is concerned. Um, if I was living by that building, I would be with these residents out here and I would probably be uh, uh, a little upset and wonder uh, why was uh, this allowed to slip through the cracks? So uh, that's that's all I want to say. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Strat. I'm right. You got my name right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't call him Mr. Schultz. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> the only comment that I really would like to make is that the way that it's currently zoned and it is zoned and it had been zoned, is that actually a five-story motel or hotel could actually be, and there are many uses that could be actually put on this site, five-story without any special land use approval. This is unique in a sense that it requires special land, but I certainly am concerned and certainly know the concerns that were expressed and I have equally concern as previously just mentioned. I think this is perhaps a, the best of the bad things that could be put on this site being a five story because you could have some other, you could have a motel, you could have a lot of activity. It could be a restaurant, it could be any kind of facility. Uh, with a lot of garbage, a lot of noise, there's a lot of different activities that it could be. So I, I, I just don't, <laughs> I don't know if you realize that there are other things that could be put on this site without our approval. We don't have to have the approval. They don't, we don't, they don't need the special land use approval, that is. The other comment I'll make is I agree with the comment of the 10-foot uh, right away, or 10-foot green belt area to try to put trees in the 10-foot. That's certainly not the type of trees that we're talking about and what you would like. I'd like to see that if it is approved, it should be much wider than that. And I know that there's a turnaround, but I think it still could be accomplished. That is a big concern that I would have. Whatever trees they plant, uh, it, it really needs more space than that, as previously just mentioned by one of the individuals that came up to us. Those are my two comments that I have to make. Mr. Edmonds, do you have another comment? Yeah, I just had one of uh, piggybacking on the uh, the tree situation and the green belt. There are numerous narrow evergreens that could be planted in there. They don't have to be 40 foot wide at the base. I have one on my house that I've been there 30 years, and it's no more than five foot wide. So, and and it's above the above the roof. So. I think, I think that we should just leave that to administrative approval as to what actually gets planted in there. Yeah. But I think we've raised that concern. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. 
Uh, I have to echo Mr. Strat's comment. Um, the, the ordinance was changed and there was a great deal of thought and effort that went into it. Um, I think this is a much less obtrusive building and land use than a potential five-story hotel would be. And correct me, or excuse me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was Mr. Jones that commented that it could be a restaurant and you could be smelling onion rings and pizza and having people throwing beer bottles around in the parking lot. And even if it was one story, I think that would be more obtrusive than a building that gets very, very little traffic on a daily and weekly basis. I mean, you're not going to have all 700 people visiting this building even every given month. You're only going to have a few people at a time. Um, I'm going to state something that I stated at the last meeting. I would prefer to see the building step down to three stories on the east end rather than five. I think if you were to start from the, the second window bay from the east end of the building and step the building down to three stories instead of five, I think we would get a whole lot less pushback. Unfortunately, um, the zoning ordinance says that we can have five stories there, so that would have to be something that would be offered by the developer, not something that we can demand. Um, but I truly believe that there are much more obtrusive and intrusive uses that could go on this same property uh, adjacent to residential. Kevin, do you have any comments? Yeah, yeah I have a few comments. Uh, I know I, I kind of felt the same way as residents in the area. It's that this is pretty big, but uh, mind you, you know, several compromises have already been made. You know, it is, uh, I believe, 75 feet away from the lot line, so it's not in directly on your lot line. It's not close. Uh, so, you know, you're at a 45 degree angle just to hit the lot line there. Uh, with the 75 foot height. Also, you know, some of the other concerns was uh, lighting. Are we going to put giant spotlights on this thing that's going to impede our ability to sleep at night? And, uh, you know, the city of Troy has a, a very good uh, lighting ordinance now. Every single site plan approval that comes up requires uh, approval of that as well. So the lighting levels will be low. And in particular, in the back, there's no, no visible significant signage that are going to be visible so uh, and in the daylight the coloring of the building itself is light so it won't be as obtrusive as it could be uh, privacy is good really there people there's no windows in the back from internal to the building they're not going to be spying in on you dining in, you know in your homes as well uh, so I think that you know this particular use provides more privacy than a lot of other ones could provide so it's not uh, a great use, but I think uh, he's going to wind up being successful at this location. It meets the needs of his business uh, in being able to, you know, be upfront with the, uh, you know, his customers. At the last meeting, we had customers come in here saying they would use it, and I think he's right that there are there is a demand for it in the local market. Maybe it's not what the local residents want, but you know that's his right. So that's all I got. Thank you. No, I don't have anything else to add. I think um, I'm sure I, I feel the same way that all the residents do. But I, I think if we were to take any uh, uh, position other than approving this, we would be subject to litigation and all kinds of damages. And uh, this gentleman is living in accordance with the ordinance. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have any uh, any uh, uh, any option other than to approve the site plan. So I uh, I do feel for you. I, I we listen very intently and. Uh, I, you, all of you were very eloquent in what you said, but I just, I just don't see any alternative. Thanks. Well, I'd just like to, uh, to add, I, I, again, I am sympathetic to your concerns, uh, but, but as it's been said, um, this petitioner has not only followed all of the criteria in the rules, but he's tried to be a good neighbor by doing things that we've asked him to minimize the impact of this building. I would also like to add the amount of hours that were put in to develop the master plan and the zoning ordinance were huge. It wasn't just this body. It was neighbors. It was administrative staff. It was consultants. 
it was the city council. Hundreds and hundreds of hours were put into this. And I'm sorry that you feel you weren't notified properly to, to get your, to get, have come in and give your uh, two cents. But we followed state law and made the notifications, or the city did, and made notifications to, uh, to the city. So um, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying, but as it's been said here, um, this developer has come forward and has abided by the rules, and uh, we, have to, we have to play the game by the rules. So, any other comments? Can I, yes. May I ask Mrs. Bloom a question? Since this is a special use approval, in addition to a site plan, would it be in our purview to request that the building be shortened by two stories at the east end? since they're asking for special use? Um, again, you are, you do have some discretion. You do have to make sure that they are satisfying the standards. And if you could somehow articulate how um, that would make it more compatible with adjacent uses or the master plan, you know, following uh, the, the ordinance, if you could um, somehow come up with um, some reason that, that would be required for this type of a storage, again, distinguished from the other types of allowable uses, that's another thing you have to consider is that there are other five-story uses that, that could be considered. So, so you, just, just simply the massing of the building would not be adequate justification. It, um, you, you would really need to find a special um, consideration Thank you. for that. Mr. Edmonds. I believe at a previous meeting, uh, maybe perhaps the uh, developer could uh, answer this question, are they at all amenable to reducing the, the, uh, the height of the building in the, on the east end? You need to you come forward, sir. Sir, would you come forward to the microphone? Thank you. The economics of the project would be uh, difficult to make the project work. Lower hand, but uh, it's a tight, it, the project right now is a, the, the site's a tight site and uh, the square footage. We, we really need all the square footage that we're, we're using here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if there's no further discussion, would someone like to make a motion? Sure, I'll be back. I Resolved that special use approval and preliminary site plan approval for the proposed 1800 mini storage at east side of Rochester Road, south of Waddles <laughs> at 3846 Rochester Road, section 23, currently zoned GB General Business District, be granted. Second, Second by Mr. Strat. <clears throat> On the boat? I, yes, sir. Yeah. Mr. Shepke? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Strat? Mr. Tegel? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Mr. Kempen? Yes. Mr. Krent? Krent is. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Mr. He left. Mr. Sanzica? Yes. All right. We're done. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We don't control taxes. Yes. Thank you. Ma'am, please. Thank you. All right, moving on to the next item, item number eight. It's another special use and preliminary site plan review, file number SU-406, proposed McDonald's restaurant, west side of DeQuinder, south of Big Beaver, 36895 DeQuinder, section 25, currently zoned NNB, neighborhood node B. Mr. Carlisle. Thank you. Um, the next item up for up for discussion is the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a proposed McDonald's, existing McDonald's on DeQuinder. The applicant is requesting to convert um, their single drive through lane to a double drive through lane. Um, in addition, the applicant is proposing some, um, some additional site improvements. Um, this item is located in the neighborhood node and does require a special use. Um, the item was last reviewed by the Planning Commission at its May 14th meeting. 
Um, at that meeting, there were a number of items to discuss, and I do want to personally commend the applicant. He has addressed all of our concerns uh, in, a, in, uh, in preparation of this meeting. Um, I do want to highlight the proposed um, changes based on the applicant's resubmittal. These include um, greater patio details um, for the patio that fronts onto Quinder. Uh, they've increased the, open, uh, the amount of open space as well as landscaping. Um, they have applied the necessary turning template. They have applied, provided additional street trees as required by the ordinance. Um, they have provided the, the transparency calculation that's required in the neighborhood node. Um, they have provided the additional parking lot screening as requested. Um, in addition, um, after lengthy discussion with the Planning Commission, they have provided the additional uh, building entrance onto Quinder that uh, is directly accessible uh, to the patio. Uh, location. The only outstanding issue that we have from a staff standpoint is the photometrics that were submitted um, greatly exceed the ordinance requirements. Um, with that being said, we would um, recommend that if this does get um, preliminary site plan approval, special use approval, that they come back um, as part of final and come into compliance with the lighting ordinance requirements. Um, so in summary, we find the applicant has, has made significant advancements to the, both the site as well as the architectural improvements to the building. They've met all our requirements, and so we are recommending preliminary site plan approval and special use approval uh, for the application. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Carlisle? All right. Is the applicant here? Please step forward. Mr. Martin. Uh, Frank Martin from uh, Dorch and Martin Associates, the Architects. Uh, essentially, we, as he said, uh, we uh, looked at everything that you had commented on. Uh, I want to mention that the lighting, the photometrics, um, I talked to the uh, lighting consultant today. Uh, the uh, uh, particular lights that are creating the uh, excess lighting happen to be the lights that are on the back wall that are the sconces that are lighting straight down. They're not causing a problem to the neighbors behind us. Um, we can change out those bulbs to 70 watts and we can get them down to under the 20 foot candles we need. And the other uh, item was uh, a couple of lights near the joint access uh, between the property to the north right at that access there is uh, a little more on the property line. I don't think it's a problem, but it's been that way. I know your ordinance has changed, but we'll handle that. No problem. Everything else uh, I think we took care of. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? Mr. Edmonds? Not a question, but a comment. But I certainly thank you for all the revisions that you've made. We really appreciate you listening to the Planning Commission. Well, I think McDonald's is uh, doing whatever they can do to stay active in the community. Yeah, for, they've been here 30 years. I don't think they want to go away. Thanks. Anyone else? All right, thanks. Well, again, I'll state it. This is uh, the public hearing has been closed, but if there's anyone in the audience who would like to speak to this item, please come forward. <laughs> Seeing no one. Gentlemen, would we have a resolution? Mr. Edmonds. Resolved that special use approval and preliminary site plan approval for the proposed McDonald's restaurant improvements, west side of Dequinder, south of Big Beaver, 36895 Dequinder, section 25, currently zoned NN, B, neighborhood node B, be granted subject to the following condition. Number one, resubmit photometrics which comply with Article 13 of the ordinance. Second. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Stratt? Yes. Mr. Tegel? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Kempen? Yes. Mr. Sanzika? Yes. Mr. Shepke? Yes. Thank you. Good job. All right, item number nine. This is a uh, special use request and preliminary site plan review. It's a public hearing. Uh, yeah. File number SU408, proposed modern <coughs> kitchen, bath, Tabak Stone, west side of John R., south of Big Beaver, 2701 through 2703 John R., section 26, currently zoned IB, Integrated Industrial Business District. Mr. Carlisle again? Yes. Um, before I start, I really um, very briefly want to introduce Ryan um, Denias. Uh, he is interning at our office and he's shadowing me today. Um, Ryan assisted me with the review of this site plan. Um, so. If it's, if it's good, I'll credit for Ryan. If you guys <laughs> don't like it, I'll, I'll take the bullet for this one. Um, 
The applicant tonight before us is Modern Kitchen and Bath. Um, they're an existing facility located on John R. Road. The applicant is requesting a special use approval to uh, fence in a portion of their existing parking lot uh, for outdoor storage. The uh, fenced in area will be located on the northwest corner of the site. Um, the applicant proposes to store unfinished granite uh, stock, which was uh, not to exceed six feet in height. In addition on the site plan, the applicant has shown the areas of where the stock is going to be located. Um, we have reviewed this with engineering as well as fire, and they do not have any additional uh, circulation concerns. Um, the applicant is proposing along um, the, the north and the west elevation adjacent to the, to the proper, to adjacent properties, an eight foot high concrete wall. Um, a six foot high concrete wall is required by ordinance. However, the applicant has come in with an eight foot high wall um, uh, for approval tonight. I think the applicant has some discussion points that, in regards to that wall, um, but I'll leave it to the applicant to address that. Um, the applicant has uh, noted that they will submit a lighting plan that comes into compliance with section 1305. Um, it was a note on the site plan. We have not received a lighting plan or known what lighting is going to go in that location. So we do note that if this is approved or recommend for approval that they do submit lightings that's in compliance as part of this final site plan approval. Um, we did review the application on their special use standards. They do uh, comply with all requirements and as such um, we are recommending final site plan approval. Again, contingent upon submitting the necessary lighting plan and elevations. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions for Mr. Carlisle? Just a comment. Go ahead. I think Ryan did an outstanding job with <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he thanks you too. Mr. Butler, would you like to come up and share with us? Absolutely. Good evening, Jim Butler with Professional Engineering, 2430 Rochester Court, Suite 100, Troy, Michigan, 48083. I can honestly say I've never been in this chamber when there's been nobody behind me. <laughs> in all the years I've been here. Do you feel safe? Do you feel safe this tonight? Is, I don't know if I feel safe or not. I, I tried to get Mr. Martin to stay. <laughs> I stayed for him. I thought it would only be kind. <clears throat> and since I did the, the, for the previous application for his turning mo movement diagram, I did that for him as a favor. He <laughs> thought he would stay, but obviously he was not going to. Um, and Mr. Carlisle's letter is pretty specific on what our request is. Um, I did have the opportunity to review the application with the owner this evening. Um, he had expressed a concern about the height of the wall being eight feet. Um, he thought it was a little bit out of scale with this building once he kind of looked at what it was going to be. I would ask your consideration if you would consider a six foot fence in lieu of that. Either way you want to go with it, we're fine with it. Um, he spent a lot of money on his building and he's going to continue to do that. He's a very proud guy. He does very good granite work, so if you're in the need for granite, we had our office recently redone and he does a great job. So um, with that, I'll answer any questions. What's Are that? Are you a Pierre person? Or no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not at all. But he does a good job. Mr. Carlisle. I have a point of question for Mr. Butler. You noted a six foot high fence. Um, wall. I'm sorry, a screen wall. Same wall you're proposing, but only six feet. Nine. Only six foot high. The stock does not go above six feet. I just wanted to clarify, not offend the wall. Where, where did the eight foot come into play? Uh, it was actually the applicant submitted the eight foot high we did. wall. Okay. As so part of their application. The requirement is? The requirement is six feet. The planning commission can grant, can require up to eight feet. And is the wall, and I'll direct this to you, uh, Mr. Carlisle, is the wall all the way down to where the pavement ends, or is it just stop where the where the um, indication of the stock was going to stop? In, um, my understanding is it stops where the end of the outdoor storage area is where the gate is located. Is that correct? Uh, Can you bring that, that up? Where it, where it extends from the south side of the building, oh, I see. Okay. there's a gate. There's a 30-foot wide gate. Then it's a wall from there all the way to the west property line, up to the north property line, all the way across to about two-thirds of the way east end and then it turns and stops where there's a pedestrian door. So that's essentially the wall right there where the cursor follows. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Edmonds? And the dumpster is located where? The existing dumpster is essentially, if you can run the cursor up front, go due north, a little bit over to your right, oh. right there. It's that's where the dumpster is. It's within. The other thing I was going to ask, that uh, just a quick follow-up, when I was out there today, a lot of debris is at the north 
let's see, no, that'd be the southwest section outside of where that wall would be that ends yes. the building. Is yes. That, that will go away? That will go away. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, Mr. The Schultz. dumpster is going to stay within the secured storage area? Yes, it is. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Thank Chairman? You. Yes, Mr. Being six foot nine, I, I would object to a six foot wall. I'm sorry? <laughs> I said being six foot nine, I think I would object to a six foot wall. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't have a problem. You can, you can look at the granite without clock <laughs> over the wall. I don't know. No, I have no objection. I'm just All right. Six foot. All right, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Edmonds. Well, having bought a lot of granite just recently, not from Quebec, of course, <laughs> but those slabs can, can go a lot higher than six foot high. Yes, they can. Uh, do, do they store those inside the building? There are ones they do store inside the building, the larger, larger pieces. Thank you. Thank you. This is a public hearing. If there's anyone out there in the audience who would like to come forward, not seeing anyone, we'll close the public hearing. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Schultz. Resolved that special use approval and preliminary site plan approval for the proposed modern kitchen and bath slash, or modern kitchen slash bath dash Quebec stone outdoor storage, west side of John R., south of Big Beaver Road, 2701 through 2703 John R., section 26, currently zoned IB, integrated in industry and business, uh, be granted. Second, Mr. Edmonds. Oh, do you want subject to sub, subject to the submission of a photometric plan and fixtures, and that the uh, wall will be six feet tall? I agree. You still second? Mr. Strat. Yes. Mr. Tagle. Yes. Mr. Edmonds. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Kempen. Yes. Mr. Sanzika. Yes. Mr. Shepke. Yes. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. All right, moving right along. Public comments for items on the current agenda and seeing the room has cleared out, we'll move to Planning Commission comments. Start with Ryan, do you have any comments? We go around the table and just... Uh... No, I do not. Okay. I would, I'd like to get your opinion. How did uh, Mr. Carlisle do tonight? Pretty good. <laughs> Did you really think he'd say anything else? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see what he would say. We'll talk later. Mr. Carl, do you, do you have any comments? Uh, no, I just want to compliment the Planning Commission. The, the self-storage was, a, was a, a tricky item and a complex item, and I think the Planning Commission handled themselves well and handled the matter well. So thank you. <clears throat> Frank, I know I said this to you earlier, but I want to publicly tell you what a, what a great job you did on your video. I don't yeah. know how many of you guys had a chance to look at that, uh, but it, it was fantastic, yeah. Nice. Yeah, nice job. Do you have any comments? Um, uh, this was a good first experience here, obviously. Uh, it was cool sitting here, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agree with uh, Mr. Carlisle. The, uh, the storage facility, I, I thought that was really interesting. It was, uh, it was probably one of the more controversial things you guys have dealt with, I'm assuming. Uh, no, yeah, I thought it was just, I thought it was, uh, everyone handled everything great, and uh, I'm looking forward to next time. Thank you. Mr. Edmund, no comment. Mr. Schiffke, no comment. Mr. Schultz? I just want to give prior warning that um, I will probably not be at either of the July meetings, as I will be out of the country. So... Uh, I definitely will not be at the regular meeting in July, and I will be arriving home late the evening before the special study session, so whether I will be attending that meeting is still up in the air. Well, thank you for the I warning. may decide to be staring at the inside of my eyelids at that point. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. Strat? No comment. Mr. Kempen? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, point out for those that are at home listening still uh, that the master plan review process is just starting, so there is an opportunity to get involved in reviewing that and uh, providing your uh, input and feedback to the uh, city as uh, the whole process is uh, going to begin, and it's going to take probably a year, 18 months, something like that, before that new master plan would be approved. So just want to let you know. Thank you. Mr. Sanzica? Just um, <clears throat> I wanted to comment. I, the, the last meeting I, that I attended, I... I, we discussed, you know, issues that possibly could be in the master plan, and I brought up the issue of an entertainment district 
and I think a few days afterwards you announced the um, theater that was proposed, and I, I was just so happy to hear that. You know that they've, and one of the comments was that from the developer was that they they have found that the Troy has changed their attitude in how they develop uh, the planning process and how it's it's moving a lot faster. And I, I just want to compliment the planning department and and they're all the uh, the people that within the city. That, that is, I think that should be your goal is to help to develop property and, and make. Uh, I was proud to be uh, Troy residents, and and I'm I am proud to be a, uh, on the planning commission. So I just uh, want to express my gratitude and uh, and my ha happiness to hear that that type of development's going on in the city of Troy. Thank you, Mr. Savinat. Would you like to enlighten us with anything tonight? Uh, no comment. We have not yet received an official application from the MGR movie theater folks, but we are working with them and moving them along. Great. Good news. Mrs. Bloom. I'm just glad to be with you again, and it does look <laughs> like uh, you will have me here for another month or so at least. Wonderful. So, uh, so. Well, we all feel the same. Appreciate you <laughs> being here. Mr. Chairman, if I can yeah, make yes, one more Mr. comment. Mr. Schultz. Since we all live in different parts of the city, and some of you may not have as frequent access or need to go on Big Beaver Road as I, I just wanted to let you know that there is feverish work being done on Fishbones and Carabas property. Um, the big cement pipes and everything are in and there's dirt being thrown all over the place. So that, that ugly vacant lot will not be an ugly vacant lot much longer, which I personally think is wonderful because it's been ugly and vacant ever since I moved here in 85. Well, and to, and to piggyback on that, there's a couple of developments that we've approved in the past that are, are well on their way, uh, almost complete one of them, and the other one is well on its way. Uh, anyways, I appreciate all of the comments and the, that we heard tonight. This was a, a tough topic and, uh, you know, had some emotional aspects to it, but uh, appreciate uh, all of your input. And with that, I'll say we're closed. We're adjourned. Mm -hmm.